Hello and welcome to Inside Sports. I'm your host, Todd Blackstock. We have a fun show for you today as the owner of Worldwide Technology Raceway, Curtis Francois, joins us to discuss the revitalization of the track and share with us some major events coming to St. Louis. Plus, former NFL football player Will Franklin, who starred at Mizzou and Vashon, has made his way back to his alma mater, and he will join us as well. So stick around for this and much more coming up next on Inside Sports. And welcome to the show. Our first guest today is a former race car driver who left the sport only to return to save what is now Worldwide Technology Raceway in Madison, Illinois. And this time we welcome Curtis Francois to Inside Sports. Curtis, thank you so much for joining us today and spending time in uh, such an exciting period of racing here in St. Louis. Well, it's just great to be with you. I tell you what, uh, oh, I guess 10, 11 years ago, the Gateway International Raceway was, was falling on hard times. I mean, I read where they were getting ready to tear down the grandstands. And then all of a sudden, Curtis Francois comes in for the rescue. Can you give us a little information on uh, you know, what brought you back into racing and which are, what made you want to save the racetrack? Well, you know, as a proud St. Louisan, and I also do a lot of work in the Metro East uh, in my real estate development company, I was aware that the track was closing. I'd raced there and been a, a part, they'd been a big part of my life over the years. And when I heard the racetrack was closing, I ultimately reached out and said, just keep me in the loop on what's going on here. I had no real thoughts at the time that I would ultimately be the owner of that. But I wanted to try to help facilitate it landing in a good spot. And one thing led to another, and I'm now the owner. And now you're the owner. So you were a racer. At one time, and we were just talking before the show, you said you used to love to ride motorcycles. Um, I had a moped, and I had a wreck my senior year in high school on a moped, and I tore my arm up, and I'm like, you know what? If I can't handle a moped, I better not get on a motorcycle. So uh, I know you had some experiences, uh, you know, in dirt pass and riding motorcycles and racing cars. Uh, did you have any instances that uh, made you maybe want to you know, retire from that. Well, I did. I think, um, you know, it was a great part of my life, enjoying riding in the woods, and that kind of led to uh, racing some. And uh, uh, one big wreck kind of turned things around for me and thought, well, you know what, I'd be much better off with a seat belt and some metal around me. So I switched over to race cars and uh, really just enjoyed that process of learning to drive as a novice and then per, uh, proceeding through many years of racing professionally. Now, you're racing professionally, and you know, you see all the big races and you see the big wrecks, Earnhardt and, you know, Rick Mears and people uh, over the years. And it's like, at some point you might get second thoughts. Did uh, anything ever happen? I understand you were in a race and you had a kind of a close call. Yeah, you know, I, I raced uh, a mainly open wheel. Uh, and so Indy Lights, uh, was I was in a car actually racing at Gateway. And uh, it was a situation where uh, you kind of call it a, a little bobble that at about 185 miles an hour, the back end started to come out on me. And, and I saved it, and I didn't wreck. Uh, but my thought not went to uh, pushing forward. I had a six-month-old daughter uh, sitting in the motorhome uh, with, my, with my wife. And I thought, you know what, I better start looking, uh, looking further down the road and ultimately said that uh, that would be my last year of racing. So... Uh, I've raced a little bit after that, but uh, that was my last big race. And, uh, you know, I, I look back and it was just the best time, I think, that I could possibly have in that sport. I met so many great people, uh, went to so many different, so many great tracks, which prepared me ultimately for being a track owner. Um, and it really was just a wonderful time in my life. So it seems like a pretty neat uh, symbiotic relationship with you being a race car driver and in real estate as well. So you've got a vision. From 2010, 2011, since the point that you bought the track, I mean, it's undergone a huge facelift and so many different things have been added there. Can you fill us in on, I know there's a golf course there now, um, on what you've done to transform this into a world-class facility? You know, what's, what's 
great about the track is the, the bones of the track, the actual racing surfaces, the grand stands were all great. They were only 13 years old when I took over the racetrack. And then, to, so that's what I saw, that there was an opportunity there uh, to use my knowledge that uh, I'd gained through racing at tracks around the country and, and, and as a racer, and then bringing that together with my business background and saying, I think I know what the problem is here and let's go at it. And it really was turning the business model around to really a grassroots model of, of going after the grassroots fan, the fan that uh, is proud to call that track their home track. And ultimately, I think 10 years later, we would look back and that was the right strategy to really build it from the ground up with our grassroots fans. Recently, there was a big announcement at Ballpark Village. Tom Ackerman was the MC. We had the individuals, Dave Stewart, and some people from Worldwide Technology. You were there uh, announcing a huge series of events coming to St. Louis in 2022. And I know uh, race car fans are so excited about this. And can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the NASCAR situation coming to town? Sure, yes, we made that announcement September 15th, that uh, June 5th, 2022, for the first time ever, uh, NASCAR Cup will be coming to St. Louis, which is a, uh, it's a game changer, it really is. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an, uh, an opportunity that could be transformational for the area, uh, as well as just great entertainment for our city. So we're going about the process now of getting the track ready for that June 5th. Uh, and really, it's going to be a process of, of, of letting folks know what this can really mean to the community. It's about a $60 million economic impact for the community. We'll have close to 100,000 fans there over three days. Uh, you've got 34,000 meals that will be served to all the different people that are coming in that support the, the series. Uh, just really an unbelievable uh, economic impact that I think folks will realize when the, the, I call it the circus, when the circus comes to town. I mean, you can almost compare the circus to what, an NHL All-Star game weekend or, you know, a World Series game, a NFL game. What yes, think? I think it operates certainly at that level. Uh, NASCAR has about 80 million fans nationally. Uh, all of those eyes will be on the St. Louis region on uh, June the 4th and June the 5th. Great win for the city, but for the people that are looking for something thrilling to go do on that weekend, there's going to be no better place to be, than to being at Worldwide Technology Raceway for that, that race. Yeah, we'll bring that up again here in a few minutes. Um, but St. Louis, I understand, has a unique uh, opportunity now to have like the three biggest racing car events in the country, and it might be unique to our region. It is really. It's it's part of the the uh, the process as we were really trying to rebuild the facility. We were able to sign a long term agreement with the NHRA. That's the Hot Rod Association uh, Hot Rod Association Drag R Racing Group, um, and so that's how we started in 2012 with with the NHRA. Then along came IndyCar and signed it. We just signed a new five year agreement with them, and so those are two of the, the two of the uh, pieces of the three-legged stool. The other one is NASCAR, a NASCAR cup race. And so putting those three together really solidifies the future of the racetrack uh, for many, many years in, in ahead of us here. I do understand that the, the shape of the track is unique as well. And a lot of the drivers, you know, they like the challenge of it. It's not just a, a big circle. There are some, you know, some twists and turns about our track. You know, we've got a track that was really set up for racers. Uh, long straightaways with tight turns. And so you really have to uh, set your car up for one end of the, the track or the other and compromise on the other, which means that you have to be the driver to get around that, that corner that the car may not be optimized for. So uh, without getting too deep in the woods, it really, in the weeds, it really makes it, it, it a, a driver's track that you have to come prepared to uh, get that car around the track at speeds that sometimes it doesn't want to go, uh, <laughs> but the guys do a great job. It makes for tremendous racing. Uh, and that's why I think with the Cup Series, you're going to see some of the best racing that you'll see all year will happen at Worldwide Technology Raceway. How important is it to have the, the founder and owner of Worldwide Technology, Dave Stewart, and you know, the Bomberito Automotive Group, John Bomberito, guys like that spearheading the, the sponsorship efforts and you know, club suites and things like that. That must be huge to have that corporate support. Well, I think, first of all, the three of us all love St. Louis, and, and the best interest of St. Louis is, is core to our mission. Uh, and when you're, when you're able to walk lockstep with guys that have that, uh, that same value set and really we're, we're looking at things in the same way, 
uh, it really the synergy of the three of us working together has been tremendous. Are there motorcycle races out there? There are mo motorcycle races actually on the drag strip and uh, sometimes on our road course, yes. A friend of mine, James Harvey Dodds IV, he bought a Lotus a couple years ago, and he takes it out there on Worldwide Technology Raceway, and so it's actually accessible to the public and accessible to race car fans and guys that are novices that want to get out there. How does that work if you uh, have a souped up car and you want to get out and air it out and not get a ticket? Yeah, well, it's the best place to do it, uh, for sure. We, we work uh, with the city trying to bring uh, the guys that are street racing and saying, hey, there's a much better way for that, this to happen. Bring that off the street, bring it to the racetrack. We do that in the drag strip, and that's done on a regular basis. We have weekly events that, that uh, participants that you may not be a professional or you might not may not even be a, a regular but you can come out and drive just about any car that's safe on on a drag strip but on drag strip but on the on the road course we really offer about twice a month an opportunity for you to get come out bring your street car we'll give you some instruction and really just the basics of driving on a road course and it's it's a neat opportunity for guys to bring out all these great cars they're building today and see what they'll do in a safe environment now, what is the seating capacity out there? So we are about 57,000 seats on the oval, uh, about another 20,000 seats over the drag strip. And so is there multiple events available to do at the same time? Because I know there's a golf course out there. You've got different tracks. Is, there, is it simultaneously going on, or is it kind of like st uh, sticking to the event of the day? So you'll see it sometimes where we might have three separate events going on. We'll have something going on the drag strip. We'll have something going on on the road course or on the oval. So a race uh, going on in the cartplex. We have a karting center there as well. You might have a 5K run that is going on. We really, really utilize the facility as, as it was meant to be, which is a multifaceted facility that is really just a great gem for our community. And if someone wants information on tickets or what they need to do to attend this event, what do they need to do? Go to our website. It's going to be the best thing. It's www.raceway.com, or you can always call Taylor. She's going to pick up the phone, 618-215-8888. Any final thoughts, anything that we left out that you'd like to mention? Well, I just think it's, it's worth mentioning again uh, what a great opportunity it is for our region uh, to bring a cup date. And we just would really encourage folks to, to go to the website, look at that, and understand that this is a major league event coming for the first time to the Midwest. Well, well, Curtis Francois, thank you so much for what you've done to revitalize that raceway and, and what you're doing to bring great you know, economic impact to our city. My pleasure. All right, we appreciate it. We're going to take a quick break now, but on our way out, we'll show you some images from St. Louis and NBA superstar Jason Tatum's recent basketball camp for kids. Stick around. We'll be right back. Hey there, it's Angela Scheib. I'm here at the Old Gymnasium Center, community center really, for the Jason Tatum basketball camp. The people are already getting ready to go behind you. I'm going to try to show you everything that is happening here today. on the rise now. I caught up with Alderwoman Clark Hubbard. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Why is today important? Today is important for so many reasons. First of all, why are we here celebrating what's good about St. Louis? What's good about St. Louis? Our own very own star basketball star, Jason Tatum. He's good from St. Louis and now he's good in coming back and giving back to St. Louis. So today he gave a free free camp to the children in the neighborhood, the children in the community, and they are having an amazing time. And I have to tell you, what I am so impressed by him is that he's, he really was trying to keep this kind of quiet. This yes. is kind of like he's just doing this out of the goodness of his heart. He yes. didn't really want media here. He didn't yes. really want all the attention. Yes, he didn't. He didn't. And that always um, impresses me about him. That wasn't just like this event. Every event that I've come to that he's been here giving back, he never is about the pomp and circumstance of it. He is here genuinely giving back from his heart as well as his team and as well as his family. And I believe this room we're in is a 
has a lot to do with him, correct? Absolutely. One of the last things he did prior to this event was he came and gave this computer lab, donated the computers, the printers, the screens, everything to this computer lab for children to use day to day or the community to come in and have different resources, that can, different levels of resources they can use to uplift their, you know, uplift their lifestyle. That the brothers on the rise now. Woo! Endless celebrations all in my house. Yeah. Levitating now, I'm super duper fly now. Yeah. London boy, but they see where I reside now. Put the time in while you always yelling time out. Yeah. And for quit it, cause I know I'm coming with it. You were sitting, you were wishing I was handling my business. Yeah. Now I got the ball like Harry Potter playing Quidditch. And my mother's still humongous. You were thinking that happens in there. Damn man. Well, that is going to do it for us here at SCL TV. But I have to tell you, it was a very special day. Very important people got proclamations. It's really important to think about everybody that comes together to make this happen. And I feel like we might as well leave it right here on the shot of this awesome floor that Jason helped to get. Make sure you keep it right here on SCL TV and experience St. Louis. I got to Moxie after I hurt my neck. First, I took them to feel better. Then, I just kept taking them. I didn't know they'd be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. Back to the show. Our second guest today was a star wide receiver at Bashan High School here in St. Louis. He was a star at the University of Missouri and was drafted in the fourth round in the NFL draft by the Kansas City Chiefs. He has now come full circle as he's the head football coach at Vashon here in St. Louis. William Franklin, welcome to Inside Sports. Welcome, welcome. Appreciate it. Nice to be here. You know, we were just talking about this a minute ago. You, when you were a star athlete, a student athlete of Vashon, we had you on way back in the day, you know? Yeah. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. I mean, uh, it was right when I walked in the studio today, I was just like, okay. Uh, I think it might have been over a different part of the room, yeah, man, but, uh, but we saw you as an upcoming star yeah. uh, coming through the ranks of the public high, and you know, we're the City of St. Louis Communications Division, yeah. so it's important for us to highlight people and individuals in the St. Louis doing great things. And it was sure uh, fun watching you, the helicopter, <laughs> back in the day, watching you lift up with some of those amazing, uh, you know, amazing catches and moments. And, you know, tell us about your, you know, you know, the journey, you know, through growing up playing football. You know, you probably played in the Junior Football League and then on to Vashon. Yeah, tell man. us about, it you was, know, when um, you got started in football. Well, I say I only played two years of high school football. That was uh, it, so you just jumped right in. My first love is basketball. All man. right, so you're I, a hoopster. I, yeah, man, I chased that round ball for a long time and uh, got to high school and gave football a try. And, you know, I look back at it like if I would have played a little more, I probably would have lasted a lot longer on the back half of life uh, of the football career. But uh, the experience in itself uh, that I've had over the 14, 15 years I was able to play, man, it was amazing. Well, it seems like a, a, a wide receiver or a tight end with some size <laughs> You know, could be a basketball player, yeah. could be a really good football player. Yeah. I mean, they said LeBron James had teams like the Cowboys wanting to sign him as a tight end yeah. or a wide receiver. Yeah. You, know, you can see how the athleticism of being a wide receiver or a tight end or, or a wide receiver, you know, a basketball player, yeah. maybe like a forward, small forward would really transcend into be a, a wide receiver or tight end. Yeah, I tell a lot of guys uh, doing multiple sports helps when you figure out what exactly the sport you're going to do. So I encourage a lot of young men and young ladies to play every sport that you can. Uh, I created my footwork from basketball, but also cre created my physicality in basketball from football. And I created track with everything because it gave me the speed. So I did all those things in high school. And it, you know, when it was time to make a decision to strictly focus on football, uh, I was able to use track and basketball without taking from those sports. and. You know, I became, you know, what, what everybody calls the helicopter <laughs> and all those good things. What was the recruiting process like 
back in 2008, 2007 as compared to today? It's night and day. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually thankful we didn't have social media uh, back then because now coaches, you know, at first, you know, we had house phones, so they would call the house. You know, now coaches call your cell, they DM you on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. However they can get in contact with you, they're going to get in contact with you. Uh, so I, it's... it's you just got to watch your every move, yes, too. Yes, man, so it's, it's, it's very tough, man, uh, especially for the student athletes uh, because you want to be a kid, you know what I mean? So sometimes you might like something or post something, and that represents who you are now in, this, in the society that we live in, and it can hurt you in some ways, you know what I mean? So for me, you know, it's very night and day from me just being able to answer a call or a coach telling my high school coach, hey, I'm going to call him about 6 o'clock so I can be at home sitting by the phone waiting for the phone to ring. Versus now, coaches text you. They can text unlimited texts, you know, throughout just, the year. And right. it, when it's open season of recruiting, um, like I said, they can DM you. Any social media platform they can use to recruit you. It's so like it's just, TV now. You can watch your shows. Just click on whatever you want to yeah, watch. You don't have to set a DVR. Yeah, no. You just go online and yeah, hook it up man. anytime so you want. I can't imagine being a, a top priority recruit in this day and age, knowing that you know you probably got 30, 40 schools. And everybody's doing that, DMing you, texting you, calling you, uh, checking your social media. You know what I mean? Like, that's it's a lot. Crazy, huh? Yeah, it's crazy. Before we, before we move on to what's going on now, do you have any highlights from Mizzou that you'd like to share? Because uh, you're a pretty <laughs> pretty big dog down there, making um, some, a lot of touchdowns, a lot of yards. You yeah. had some great quarterbacks to play with. Yeah. I always refer back to my uh, senior year when we were 12-2 and two, and ended up number one in the country being Kansas. Uh, that, that Kansas game always just highlights and kind of put the cherry on top of the career I had there and uh, everything that we were able to overcome over the years uh, when we were just the Bad News Bears and – you know, four years later, you got the quality of recruits from myself, Macklin, Rucker, Tony Temple, mostly in-state recruit kids uh, that were able to change the, the identity of football in the University of Missouri. Then you get drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs, spent some time in the NFL. Yeah. Now, I guess at some point you find out that the NFL, you got to be really good, but it's also yeah. a business. Yes, yeah, it's just a business, man. Uh, everyone there is good. You know what I mean? You, you don't make it to that level uh, and not be good. But learning the business aspect, um, having to mature and grow up faster, because it's a matter of months that your, your life changes. You know, you go from sitting around the dorm and, you know, eating out the dorm, dorm rooms or whatever to you getting a phone call and your life changes. And now you have to be responsible for all the minutes of the day versus in college. You know, it was a, a GA hounding you or a you know, coach steady <laughs> telling you to do something, kind of like a parent. And, and at that next level, uh, it's more you. You know what I mean? It's what you put into your craft and uh, how long you really want to you know, play at that level. So you were in the NFL for, for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and then uh, you ended up back in Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, you were an assistant coach there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you were, you, know, you were pretty content, having mm -hmm. a good time. And then all of a sudden, you ended back at your uh, – <laughs> ended up at – Vashon again. You know, it's a basketball school, and yeah. now all of a sudden it seems like some things are transforming. It's turning uh, into a, a pretty good football program right now. Oh, man, that, and that's the, that, was, that was the goal. Uh, yes, I was back at the University of Missouri, and uh, I, I, I never really thought I would come back to the high school ring because I was moving up at the college level. But, um, you know, when, when I'm not a super spiritual guy, but when I'm told to do something, I follow that lead. And it led me back here to Vashon, and here I am uh, in year three. And I can remember the first year, man, I had probably six kids that were, like, actually football players. Everyone else was just like, all right, they're happy to be around and be a part of the team. And I took those guys that were happy to be around and were willing to give me everything that they got, and I transformed them over the last two years. You know, it seems like a lot of the enrollments in, uh, are dropping, and a lot of the parents aren't letting their kids play football mm -hmm. anymore because of potential injuries and, and things. Um, but it seems like the, the PHL, you guys have done some co-ops that, yep. that seem to have worked out pretty good, yep. along with, you know, the pandemic really hurt everybody in, in, in 2020. Uh, and you had to push seasons back in the spring. Yep. But in a way, there is a, a silver lining, isn't there? Yes. Um, that, that, that helped more than, you know, for me uh, to give those young men more time to get bigger and stronger and faster. Uh, my approach when we were pushed to the spring was usually as we did in college. 
how good can we be to be ready for the fall? And that was their approach. And, you know, everyone's seeing the, the reward now, but a lot of our work was done in the, in the spring, uh, as you do in college, put a lot of hours into it, developing, correcting, and help them build their craft to make them be able to go out there and play freely and understand, like, I can play this game of football at the highest level. So this spring was all about getting better. And I think we got better over the spring, and here we are um, making a good run at, you know what I'm saying? It's a making a season. big run and undefeated at the time of this taping. Um, you know, it, it seems trendy right now for former NFL players to go back to their schools. I mean, you got Robert <laughs> Steeples at Dismet and yeah. yourself, Kerry Davis, who was on recently, yeah. you know, with the Steelers and Hazelwood Central's back. So yeah. it's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. People are, like, giving back to the community. People yeah. that, that did good in life, there, a lot of people flee the city and say, you know Dude. what, I'm going to stay away from that. But someone like you that takes the time out to go back in there yeah. and show people, you know, hey, I'm going to come back in here and, and try to make a difference. Yeah, it's important. Uh, you know, we all were in the shoes where we were student athletes and wish we could have someone that you can touch or even have a conversation with that had that success. Uh, but you never really have the opportunity to. You see them on television and things of that sort. So for me, myself, Kerry Davis, Jeremy out there at Kirkwood, you know, for us to be able to be someone these young men can just actually like sit and have a conversation yeah. with and, and, and understand life and what all this sport can bring you if you go by it right. Uh, it's a benefit to these young kids, while at the same time for us, it's, it's, it's doing what we always say, we want, to be, we want to be those heroes for our community. So why not continue that by being in the community again? Last question before we let you go. A couple of kids you're real proud of that have really worked hard, that uh, have a great future, and uh, a little bit about the co-ops. You know, because you're teaming up with some other schools yeah. so you can have a, you know, field yeah. the team yeah. and a quality team. Yeah. So with the co-op, um, it, it, it works well, and I, and I hope everyone can see that, you know, with the right leadership, the right team, the right merge of teams, that it can really work. I, um, so you teamed when, up with? When, when Miller, Miller, they didn't have enough to field the team. Right, and then, like, Sumner you know? teamed up with someone. Yeah, but Sumner is over at Sodan. So yeah. Uh, Miller didn't have enough. They were r r roughly around 13, 14 kids. I was sitting there probably 42 uh, before they called and, and made the suggestion like, hey, would you, be, uh, would you be willing to merge with Miller? And I was like, yes. For me, it's more kids give kids enough time to really go out there and play the game of football instead of going both ways. And for me, I, I, I wanted to take advantage of it. And sure. here we are, we, 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 we got two programs, two different schools coming together as one. And who are you proud of? I mean, we were playing well as anybody around here. And uh, it's, a, it's a credit to the kids on how they accepted the kids from the other schools. And it wasn't stepbrothers kind of relationship. It's y'all guys are here, we're here, we all one. And you know, that comes from the leadership, from both principals, our athletic director downtown, Terrence Sharp, uh, putting these two programs together and then working. Uh, we got a, a, a hell of a freshman running back, De'Ara Hill. Uh, man, this kid is something special. Uh, I've coached a lot of good talent. Uh, I can speak for myself as a talent, and he's someone very special that you're going to hear from from years to come. Awesome. Wow. Well, thank you so much for joining us here at Inside Sports. It's been a it's been a few, about six, 17, 18 yeah, years now, and you're right. back on the set. We really appreciate you joining <laughs> us here today. Thank you. All right, continued success. Yes. Well, that's our show for today. We'd like to thank Curtis Francois, Jenna Tudoroff, and William Franklin for making this show possible. We'd like to thank you for watching Inside Sports on STL TV. Experience it.